Right, so we've got the block on and we hadn't painted it. So one evening I masked it all up and painted it black just to make it look nice. So that's that. So now we're going to start putting the rest of the engine together. We're going to put the sump on and, um, and the cam box on and then do the valve timing, etc. So, so this is the engine. But I thought I'd just tell you a little story about the engine. Because I bought the engine from Don Hill, who is the man who wrote this book. And in amongst it is all the cars that were sort of known to be in England. And that was my dad's car. And it says there, look, Vic Dutton, 1955. And the number of the engine was 136. This engine that I got from Don Hill is 137. So what about that for a coincidence? So that's that. Now the engine has finished up in America in this car because it says, look, motor 136. So that's the story of that engine that was in my dad's car. But this is number 137. And, um, and then there's another book. Right, this is another book. A Touch of Genius, written by Chris Draper. Well, I can remember Chris Draper coming and visiting us when I was a kid, so that would have been in the 50s. But he was obviously absolutely dedicated to sciences, and he found out so much information that he's written this lovely book, which if you're into sciences, you've got to have one of these, because it's got so much information in it. But, obviously, they were... He was sort of got photographs of the various things and this is the photograph of the three bearing crankshaft well if you look at it it's a terrible rusty old thing well that's the crankshaft that's in that engine i had it reground cleaned it all up and that's in that engine and then the other thing that they did they also took a picture of the crankcase um to show what it looked like and it's that crankcase so it's quite obvious that old Don Hill had all this stuff and and Chris Draper said oh we're going to need a picture of the crankcase or whatever and that is the crankcase and you can see that hole just there there's a brass plug in that I put in and you can actually see the number and it's the number 137 so all that stuff came from Don Hill but it wasn't complete. You know, I mean, the crankshaft, I think they considered it was scrap. Well, I've cleaned it up, we're going to use that. And then there was a special set of rods, which obviously was in amongst the stuff, and we're using them. And um, the cam box, one side of it had obviously been in, in a shed with water dripping on it. And one side of it was completely corroded away. And we took it and had it uh, laser beam welded. And they build it up and you could, you could touch it. You could touch that while they were welding it. So it didn't distort and what have you. So then there, that was the cam hop. It was completely bare. And I thought, oh, I can't be bothered to do all that. So we gave that to Paul Smith. And he made all the studs and he fitted everything. And of course he makes new ones of these, Paul. So obviously he's got new ones. So that, that really is down to, to Paul Smith. And the camshafts are in it. I bought from, um, oh, ridiculous, can't think of his name. Comes to me in a minute. Anyway, it's got new camshafts. Um, Mickey Hudson. Mickey Hudson supplied the camshafts because he obviously had a few made. So it's got new cams, new cam followers, and the bits been welded up with a laser beam. So that's the cam box. The cylinder head is a completely standard cylinder head. And we put the original valves back, and I think that's going to be good enough initially. Um, and, you know, there's a few things on it, really, that um, are very clever design. So I thought I'd just talk about that very briefly for people who don't know about Sancers. So if we go around the other side, Tanya, because I want to be standing next to that. Mr Pettit, who was the chief designer, they obviously had the four pushrod engine, which you've seen in my trials car 
And they obviously were racing them, and then they obviously thought, well, we need a bit more power. So he made a twin cam head to fit on the four push rod engine. They put a three bearing crank, they made a three bearing crank. They made a cam box, which is nothing like this, because this is a production one. But the very, very first ones in 1922 were a modified four push rod engine. So it was very clever what he did, because he did it in a very short length of time. In fact, I think in Chris Draper's book, it tells you how long it took. But one of the clever things is, if you look at this, this is a cam box, and as you can see, it's not very deep. Well, normally, when the cam's rubbing on a cam follower, it's like that, so it has to be quite deep, and then that hits on the top of the valve. Well, what he did was he turned all this lot upside down, put it in that way round, and then the cam runs through there, so that stops it turning, and then obviously the cam rubs on the bucket inside, and to do the valve clearance, you could do that with shims through little holes that are on the other side of the cam box. But these days, we make a complete one, because they do tend to rock on the shim. So that goes like that, and then that lot, goes in there with this facing outwards so that you can put shims in. But what a clever bit of design. So that's that. So that's it now. Now the other thing was we had the sump. Luckily old Don Hill had this lovely wide sump, which in actual fact is fitted on the San Sebastian engine. But we didn't have this plate that goes in there. And of course, we're looking at it thinking, well, you know, do we put some holes there? Where do we put the holes? I, I can never remember seeing one. So, you may remember, I've lost the I mean, thing. They had it in their hand a minute ago, didn't they? Do you remember one of them? Right, so we had to make a panel. We couldn't decide what to do. But young um, Bruce, a young chap who did the valve clearances on the Janetta, works on racing engines all the time. And he told me about these things. Now these are made by BMW, and it's just a simple bit of plastic. And you make a hole, and it fits like that. But obviously when the oil's coming down, it can, the oil just falls through it. But if you're under braking and the oil goes sloshing down, it shuts solid. So it's a little tweak, that. I mean, it's a BMW part. I don't know the number, because Bruce gave me these. And luckily, we only had five, so that's all we put in. So what you do, you push that in the slot there, and it, it fits in, and, and that's it. So that is going to be ha our system. It's a bit mod, but, you know, it's, uh, I think it'll work good, and, and you can't see it anyway, so it don't matter. So if we didn't make this video, you wouldn't know about it. And you need a pair of pliers to pull that through. Thanks, John. You've got to make this a good fit, because obviously you don't want them falling out. That's it. That's in there. So that's going to go in there. So that's the baffling. John made this up. This is a, this is a um, screen it goes around the oil pump. So let's turn it over, John. Because we're going to put the, we're going to put the sump on first, I think, aren't we? Yeah. To me. Right. So that goes like that, and it stops the rocks going through the oil filter and through the oil pump, but. You know, really, it would be nice to have a proper oil filter like they do on modern cars, and also Bugatti has one. But that's the best they can have. So we've got thoughts on that, but we'll come to that at a later date. But anyway, that's a nice little job, because we didn't have one of these. Now, that's a Paul Smith oil pump, which is brand new. Again, we didn't have a decent oil pump, so we thought we'd do that. The crankshaft's in. Obviously, we did that previously and it turns lovely. I mean, there's no tight spots. It's absolutely beautiful.
The other thing we did round here, which is a bit mod, these gears tend to run dry when you first start the engine. So what you do, you fill a hole up in this crankcase and you move it up, I can't remember how many millimetre, and then what it does is it means that that is bathed in oil when you start it, because it doesn't run back. But because of that, you need to put a modern oil seal in the front because the oil would just run out the front. So it's a little bit of a mod, but it saves the gears. And obviously having a modern seal in there is not a bad thing anyway because you don't want oil running everywhere. So, so that's another little mod. So we now put the suck on. So we're going to put the baffles in with these little screws, which we're going to lock tight. They're going to go in there, put a little bit of Loctite on them, and then we put the sump on. It's, it seems to be 2 VA. Oh, really? Yeah. So I don't know what happened there. But we've got a nice set of little bolts, so we might as well use them. You've got the there. Yeah. We've got a really nice sump gasket supplied by Mickey Hudson, who's another very useful bloke. What with Paul Smith and Mickey Hudson, Sampson's are pretty well sorted out, really. So, you know, obviously we could have made a gasket, but old Mickey Hudson's had these made, and they're absolutely beautiful. So we've got a nice gasket. We're going to put a little bit of silicon on the sump, put the sump on, and that'll be that done. Here we go. Six bolts hold the sump on, which is rather nice. These nuts are rather nice because they've got a washer incorporated in them and they've got a nylock on them, which again is not original, but I thought, well, we don't want the sump falling off, so we're going to use them. We had to make the studs, of course, because when we got it, we didn't have any studs. That's where it catches, I think, just oh, there. Yeah. Look, you can see the little marks. We could have, I could have reduced that, couldn't I? Next time we have it, the bits will do that. That's it. Got to have the system. This, of course, is the larger capacity sump with this extra bit on the side, which was what they put on the supercharged cars. But obviously you could have ordered it as an extra, but luckily it came in amongst Don Hill stuff, so that was another little bit of luck, really.
Hang on, John. Right. This is what a standard sump looks like. So as you can see, it's got this little extra bit on the side, which, you know, it's quite a nice tweaky little bit, really. Unfortunately, this one has seen better days. That's what happens when you leave an engine sitting on the floor for 50 years. It eats through the sump. Has a standard copper asbestos gasket. This is not a new one, but it's in lovely condition. But in a, there's a little bit of slop, and I didn't want it overhanging the bore. So what I've done is I've put just a little bit of glue on it and set it in the right place. So when we put the head on, there's not going to be any gasket in the wrong place on the bores. And as you can see, it is not exactly difficult to turn over. So that's it, John. Head on, isn't it? Yeah. Somebody in the Morgan Three Wheeler Club was obviously very lucky to get one of these timing discs. And this man, Beert, was a famous Brooklyn's tuner, and he used to tune the double knock and Norton engines later on in the, in the 500 class and everything. And, and I expect one of the boys in the Morgan Club managed to get one of these, and he had it reproduced. I'm going back 30 years. But I thought it was such a lovely thing that I bought one, and I'm really glad I did, because, you know, it's, it's, it is a perfect what you want. You put that on there, Get it on top there, centre, set that to naught, and it helps you do the valve timing. I must take my glasses off because I keep looking over the top of them. Yeah, I reckon that's pretty good, John. Yeah, I'd say that's spot on because we could put a clock gauge on it and everything but shed racing don't do all that right so next job is the vertical drive bearing yeah and yeah we've got to put the vertical drive put the new bearing on it and assemble it with our special tool another special tool and again this is another clever part Paul Smith, Paul Smith. That goes on there. And then you put a keyway in there. If you're lucky. Quite clever, this really, because you know it's a difficult bit of design, and then this goes on there, and then the whole lot tightens up so it holds that in position and it pulls this up against that keyway, so it makes that absolutely solid and lovely. But as you can see, it's got these little tiny grooves to tighten it, so very often when you take it to bits, they've been done with a chisel, but luckily. Having a lathe and the various tools, John made up this special tool which fits absolutely beautiful and you can really tighten that up. Yes? Yeah. Now, we've got a mark somewhere. Because it has this little circlip that locks it. And I marked, oh look, that's annoying. Oh, do you think them bearings are different then? Probably. And it has to be a thousand. Well, I think I'll muller it up and we'll drill another hole.
Yeah, it might go round. Oh, I don't think so. Should be identical then bearings, you know, I could understand. Well, have a measure, have a measure, John. No, I'm turning it in the vice. Right. So we now take the thing off. A special tool, which is absolutely lovely, work like a charm. But unfortunately, it's not lined up with the circuit hole. So we're going to have to drill another one. I think it's like one and a half mil or something, John, isn't it? Press it once. There. Press it again. You've got that light there. And then press it again. And you've got that light there. So it's dead handy because it's got a magnetic base. So when you're underneath a car, you can sort of aim it at what you're working on. Or if you want a real spotlight keep pressing it and eventually it comes to that one and that's a really good light that because i've had loads of these in my life and i'm telling you that's the best one i've ever had i'm sure people will disagree with me but the other one i've got is this one which my mate oggy gave me and that's quite good because you you know, you know, unfortunately the battery's flat. This is why it hasn't got a flat battery. That's quite good. So, you know, but when you get old, you can't see. That's the problem. And you need a light. I'm going to drill a new hole that that goes in and actually stops that thing from coming undone. But we took this bearing off. We put another bearing on. Well, whether we hadn't tightened it up enough or, or what, I don't know. But anyway, we'll have to just drill another little tiny hole. Be all right, though. I had to make that, which is a bit difficult. I did my old game of cutting it off a spring. So that's off a spring, that is. But I don't think it'd come loose anyway, but it's worth having it. Don't have to go in very much, John. Right, don't you think? Yeah, it come out. It? It come out. Right, so now this goes in the front of the engine and drives obviously the camshafts. Now the good thing about this is, is that it has a step keyway in here, so when you take the head off and do something and put it back again, you can't upset the timing. But to start with, ideally that wants to be facing exactly like that. So when you put it in, Unfortunately, when you engage the gear, it turns, so you've got to sort of guess a bit of a start like that. I think that will be need more than that. Now, what we do, John, if we warm that up, we can get it in and out. You can get it in and out without struggling. So we do that.
We're very lucky in the fact that everything fits tight into this crankcase because normally an old thing is all worn out. So that's very good really. See the difference? Bit of heat. No, that's not going to be right. That's it. So that is facing like that. A little bit of slot there, which obviously helps it all. So the next thing we've got to do is gasket on there and put the tube on. This is another bit we had missing. We didn't have one of those. And again, Paul Smith. Good thing about Paul Smith is he's got his own car, which is an absolute knockout, and his dad's got a car. So not only has he made bits to sell to people, he's made them for himself. So he's tried them out, and you know they're going to work. And, I mean, it does. I mean, all the holes, dead in the right place. Perfect. I've tried it on. That bit fits in there perfectly. So, you know... The stuff's a knockout. I mean, I'm used to buying stuff and then you get it and then you've got to start work on it. And the pistons, the home-in pistons, 70 years in, on and off in the family, whether they'd be any good, of course, is another story, but we'll see, we'll see. I intend to put this engine in the car that I bought in Portugal because I've never touched the engine apart from cleaning the sump out. And... This year, I'm hoping to go on a few rallies with it, and I'd like to just have a look in the engine, probably put some piston rings in it or something. I think it's going to be absolutely beautiful, but you never know, do you? So now Paul Smith supplied us with some stainless steel nuts. He couldn't get all the ones. He said the only ones he could get were stainless steel, but they're double nuts. In other words, they're not little skinny ones. They look like vintage ones, which are really nice. They're, they're just that little bit fatter. And they, they, they really look the part, so I'm quite happy with them. The good thing about the Samson and the reason the cylinder head gaskets don't seem to give any trouble, there's loads of room round, round the bores. And the reason that is, the original engine, which Mr. Pat had designed originally, was going to be air-cooled. So there were four air-cooled barrels on the four pushrod crankcase. I don't think they ever made anybody, but there is pictures of it, and there's pictures in Chris Draper's book. So, um, so that is how this managed to be so long. But it's so good, because you've got all this area. I mean, on a BMC engine, you've got a little bit like that, so it's a problem. But one of the other things is it's a good job it is, because inside the cylinder head, it's not got a post there. So you've got the face of the cylinder right there and the face of the cylinder right there. So when you pull it down, you can't tighten it up very much because the whole thing would collapse. So that's another good reason that you've got all that gasket. But we'll see. I mean, although I used to ride in these cars when I was young with my dad, I can never remember having any trouble with anything. But, um, I mean, that was a long time ago. Can we get that in? No. Start again. We don't choreograph this, this is all real. So when we keep making mistakes, it's because we're not very clever, really. So this is the key way. There's a little bit narrower that side than that side. And you put that in there. And then when you put the cam gear on, it can only go on one way because you've got this step. So we'll have to step facing forward. Then this spring goes in and keeps all that lot under tension, but only, it doesn't rely on that to keep it under tension. There's a hardened steel thing and you screw the lid down and that, but you'll see that later on.
So when we got this engine, we didn't have any studs at all. So, you know, we made those and various studs. But when it comes to doing the cam box, I thought, oh, it's such a lot of work. So old Paul Smith did that. Luckily, when we fit the cylinder head, the valves don't crash into the pistons unless you're very, very silly. So, you know, it's another thing you don't have to worry too much about. So we can be a bit casual there, whereas normally you'd be getting it in the right place. Because even when it's together, you can turn it over and it doesn't touch the pistons. Cylinder heads. This is another little interesting thing. This is a cylinder from the four push rod engine. So when I say that Mr. Pettit designed the twin cam head to go on the four push rod engine, he did. Because this is a four push rod cylinder head. You can see one, two, three, four. And you look at the original cylinder head, which is the one proper one for the twin cam, it's exactly the same. The only thing we've done there is we've made these inserts up to take 14mm plugs, because we've got millions of 14mm plugs, and we don't have to go and buy any, which I find is very good. So I, I do that. I think it's such a big help. So there you are. That's the cylinder head. Same size little port, one port for the inlet, so the fuel has to go all the way around and in there, but it seems to work. So what do you reckon, John? Just that's it. Drunk that on. Yeah, now, we got this. So we need to put the, the filler tube. Again, this is a part we didn't have, because what happens is, there's a little drain on the cylinder head that drains down into here, and we didn't have this. In fact, we didn't even know what it looked like. So we looked at the um, Portugal car, and it's absolutely original, and that is how it looks. So we copied that exactly, and that goes in there, like that. And then when you put the head on, you have to guide that little drain pipe in to that hole. So if you take the head, John, I'll make sure I'm here to... That's it. That's it. So there you are, you see. So now this little piece of tube is going into there, which is where you fill it up with oil, and also where it breathes from. And on here, you've got to have copper washers, because underneath there is the water. There's no post inside the head, which is not very good design, but obviously you've got to remember that this was a cycle car, and it was made to a price. You know, they, they couldn't afford to do everything absolutely to the book. But obviously, if you had some of these cylinder heads made today, you'd have a post inside there, so you've got something to pull down on. I think people have had cylinder heads made, but I've never actually seen one. And that's why it's got acorn nuts, so that the water can't come up and come out. It can only go into there. But you can't tighten the head down very much. I forget we were at 25 foot pounds, I think, didn't we? Yeah, it wasn't very much at all, was it? They're original nuts there. Like, luckily, again, in amongst old um, Don Hill stuff, there was quite a lot of stuff, including a few nuts, and these were some of them. It's had new valve springs. Mickey Hudson supplied them. He's obviously had some made, but again, 
You know, when you look at a Lotus Twin Cam, you can't move the springs, look. So that is because it's got light cam followers, light valves, and it don't need a lot to hold them back. Mind you, it ain't going to do 8,000 revs. I would think if we do, if we do 5,000 revs, it'd be a miracle. Because I'm not going to rev it. I shan't be silly with this engine, because it's got them old Martlet pistons that I don't know how good they are. It's got the billet conrods that were made by somebody, I don't know who. So we're going to have to be a bit sensible. Because what I'd like to do is put it in the car from uh, Portugal and just drive it very gently and use it a bit to make sure it's fairly reliable and then do the engine on that car and then we'll take this out and then we'll take it all to pieces and have a good look at it all so that we know it's very good. But we'll see, we'll see. But so far I'm knocked out of it. I mean, it's a beautiful looking thing. When we get it finished we'll stand it and we'll take some pictures of it and if, if you don't agree it's the best looking twin cam ever I shall be very surprised. Some people say to us, how much is it going to cost? How could you ever estimate how much it's going to cost when you put a load of old junk together? I used to say, if I could estimate how much it's going to cost, I'd probably be Prime Minister. Right, so the stud pulled out the block, but the block's not cracked or anything, the thread was just loose. So instead of making the um, stud by using a die, we screw cut the die, screw cut the thread so that it's much bigger, and then screwed it tightly into the block. So we're now about to tighten it up and see what happens. Let's have a feel. I think it could go a little, just a whisker more. As we previously have set the valve clearance, which we did when Tanya wasn't here, um, with any luck we should be able to just put this on and get the valve timing. So we've decided to take a chance and put some gasket goo around the edge of that. Although there's not a lot of oil gets in there, it's, it's just the oil that sort of gets wasted from the cam followers, drops down and drains out of this thing at the front. It never had one at the back, so obviously when cars used to go up hills for a long way, sometimes this bit used to fill up. So one of the modifications that were done was to put this thing in the back and drain it into the, back into the sump. So, so that is not strictly original, but they, I think they did it from you know the early, earliest days. And we didn't do that, that was already there, so somebody else had done that. So any minute now, we're going to drop this on and um, hopefully do the valve timing. One of the good things about the valve timing is that Paul Smith makes a vernier gear that this drives, so you can set the timing absolutely spot on. Whereas in the old days, they had this spring in the front and you could, 
you could move this up and down very slightly to try and get the valve timing right, but I'm not, I'm not too confident of that. But anyway, so I'm pulled. But when we put this together the first time, this gear was a bit tight. So we rung up Paul, he said, oh, the gear's a bit tight. And he said, oh, dear. But, you know, he said, we, we, well, we try our hardest, but we can never guarantee everything's in the right place. But he sent us another two of these to try, which were obviously minusculely different. And, of course, this one works beautifully. So we posted him back the, the other ones, and, uh, and there we are. But that's the luck of having old Paul Smith. One got out, yeah, it had to happen. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. So this is exactly the same cylinder as a four push rod engine, and these studs hold the cab box down, and on the four push rod engine you have different studs that hold the rockers. So it's exactly the same. It was very clever how he adapted that 1922 or 1920 engine to take a twin cam head. Perfect. What we should do is clean that out so that it's got no... Or, or, put it in the water for a minute, apparently, that does it. Yeah? Yeah. A little secret here. The gasket has obviously dried out and it's shrunk. And very often, if you make them wet, they expand. I don't know how long you have to leave it, but, but we're always in a rush, so we never leave anything. Well, we'll see what happens, eh? And inside there, there's a hardened steel pad, which that pad there, which is joined to that, pushes down on. So to get the height right in the end, all you do is you just set that so that it's just touching, and, um, and that's it. But I mean, it's all, it's all lovely and clever, that. And there's a little sign there. We always put that to the front. This has obviously had a right hard time at some time in its life. Had a good old bashing. But funnily enough, I've got another one of these and it looks exactly the same. So it obviously was a slight problem. Make sure that's back right off. And you tighten that down, and then obviously, if you had to take the cam box off, you take the cam box off, and the fat key and the thin key at the front there lines up. So, you know, you shouldn't lose the timing. But this is a miracle, being able to move this round and get it absolutely spot on. So, you know, that's a big help. Perfect. That's what you pour the oil in. When you fill the engine up with oil, you put it in there. So very often, if you leave an engine lying for, you know, months, it's always good to pour a little bit of oil in there because it goes straight down and it goes on the timing gears and stops the timing gears running in no oil until the pressure gets up. Although if the hole, moving the hole up works, then they should be in a bath of oil anyway. God, it looks very tiddly poo. I, I, I mean, it'd be easy to knock all them dents out, but, I mean, you know, that means it's had a bit of a life, and you can see it. I think that's a lovely little bit, that. Yeah, obviously. Oh, no. Hang on, John. It locks onto there. 
Oh, yes. Yes. Forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot about that. Already. Already. <laughs> it's been about a day. Yeah, so really, we could sort of... Screw that down till it goes tight and then back it off. Half turn? Oh, I think less than that myself. The only thing we've got to be sure of is that when we tighten that up, it doesn't turn that. It's, the old, it oh. all, it's always going to run in gear, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like when we tighten that down, mm. we'll put a little bit of sang on that, didn't we? Alan Milliard recommends this all the time, so yeah. I, I, I've never used it. But because Alan used it, I thought, well, that's good enough for me, I'll get some. And it's supposed to be, you know, a super duper oil. I'm sure we'll get an opportunity to feel that, John. Yes. Zed. XI or is it ZX1? I think that's the one, isn't it? Yeah, ZX1. Anyway, Alan Milliard uses it, so as I say, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for us. Alan Milliard would cut this engine in half and make an eight cylinder one, or a six cylinder one, or a five cylinder one. And he'd do it with a hacksaw and a file. He's a star, that man. He's an inspiration to everybody, I think. This has a lovely little cap goes on here, which we didn't have, but we had a real one on the um, Portugal car, and John copied it, and it's a, it's a masterpiece, but I can't see it. This is a copy of the original, which we got on the Portugal car, and it looks tiddly-poo, I tell you. So this is to set the cam time in. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get the valve just opening. Mickey Hudson sent us the timing, which is the same, but we're not clever enough to do that, so we had to write it down again. But anyway, I'm sure it'll be right. And he said it works for him, and his car goes like a rocket, so that's good enough. This all looks very posh for a shed, doesn't it, with this thing here and everything. I don't know where I got them from, but they have been so useful. We've got two, and they're ground, they're lovely things. I can't remember ever buying them, so they must have come with a load of old junk or something, but they've been so useful over the years. I normally put my finger on it. I don't have all that clever stuff. I do it with my finger. And if my car's not been faster than everybody else's, I probably would be thinking, oh, well, I haven't been doing it right, but we always used to win, so. It's dead funny, the other day, Susie invited me to go to a showroom that's just been all tidied up. And it's got Formula One cars in there and, oh, Aston Martins and, Maserati, oh, fabulous selection of cars to sell. And they had Autosport all bound exactly the same, looked like a piece of wallpaper on, oh, on the... this from the front. Ready? Yeah, no, let me do it, Ivan. Oh, yeah, she's doing it. Like the gauge. Oh, right. So anyway, so there's all these Autosports. And I'm talking to this man who is the sort of number two in the situation, lovely young bloke, knew about you know, telling me about Formula One cars that I didn't even know about, but anyway. So then he asked me about what I'd done, and I said, oh yeah, I said, I went racing, and I pointed to the Autosports, and I said, take the Autosport down for 1973, open it anywhere, and you'll see me mentioned. And he looked at me like I was mad, but anyway, he went and got it, and he opened it up, and of course, I wasn't mentioned, but we had to turn over three pages before I was mentioned. And then we kept turning it over because I did 36 races that year. And Autosport, obviously, you know, didn't 
um, a write-up on all of the production saloon car races because it was quite important in 73. You know, with like Chrysler doing it and everybody was doing it, it was the thing to do. And I managed to win it outright because I kept winning in my class. So I always got a bit of a write-up. They always said Ivan Dutton won and Ivan Dutton won as usual or something. But he was very impressed, so it was quite flash really. I quite enjoyed doing that. And Susie was knocked out, so... So I'm not just all a load of old talk. I have actually done something. But I only had a shed by the side of my house. If I'd have had all this lot, I could have done a lot better, I reckon. And I didn't have John helping me either. I was doing it all on my own, you know. Slide them in and out. Oh, yeah. Being able to slide them in and stick a pin in them. Whew. Twice as easy. If my dad had have seen that, he'd have been knocked out. Um, Where do you want to go? Follow that arrow. I don't know. Exhaust. After top dead centre. 20 degrees. Yeah, so off. In that opens 20 degrees before. before. Exhaust closes 20 degrees after. After, yeah. I think. So that's a bit of overlap in there, isn't it? That bit. Yeah. Yeah, which would be. Um, you add them up, don't you? Four Something degrees. like that. Yeah, yeah, that sounds sensible. Well, if you was on a dyno, you'd move it a little bit one way, a, a little up. bit the other yeah. way. That's better. There's always, there's always another two or three horsepower to be found, apparently. But I've been doing that by guesswork all my life, yeah. and I ain't never had any problems. And to notice two or three horsepower in there. Yeah, you'd have to be good. So really, what we ought to do now is turn it a whole turn and see whether it does what it should do. What a lovely, clever bit, though, eh? And I can feel it then, I can tell you. I'll, I'll say, yeah, it's just open. We're not getting, you're not getting a fully cut, making us look like geniuses video here. I put my fingers in there and immediately felt it was wrong. Luckily, they don't crash into one another. If we was doing an Aston Martin or a bloody Lotus Cortina, I rebuilt... What did I rebuild? Oh, yeah, when the Checker flag raced the Lotus Elans, Cosworth used to do the engines, and, and Graham Wallace said, oh, we need an engine refreshing, and Cosworth were too busy. So they gave me the engine, and I rebuilt this engine on this Lotus Elan, and, you know, obviously ground about, I didn't know what you do, I can't even remember, it was bloody donkey's years ago. But anyway, I, all I can remember is the engine went back to Cosworth, Cosworth run it on their dyno and said to old uh, Graham Warner, well, your old boy that built the engine, he must be all right because it's made exactly the power it should do. So that was a sort of feather in my cap when I was a young chap. But I can't remember how we did the bow time, and it was so long ago. Probably had marks, I probably went to the marks. Yeah, it's so good when you leave the gear in and still turn it, though, John, isn't it? Um, shall I be that side because that can? Come That's it. After like that. Well, it has that ZX1 in a little oil can, didn't we, really? 
Yeah. So, so really, we're going to go round now, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. A bit more. You can make a little whistle screw in there, you know. Yeah. And it's really good. I, yeah, one of the boys that. that we had working for us, he made a little whistle. And when you turn the engine over, it used to go... So it's a good thing, that. I forget how he did it, though. It was only done with an old sparking plug. See if they're all chuffing. Right. Let me, let me... Right, try it again, and then I've got one in each one, then. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be as powerful as the front one. No, nor is that one. Oh, I see, so... Right, oh, 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 oh. right, now I'll tell you when it's just starting to open. Walk oh, back. Back. Yeah, it's sort of opening around about. Well, let's get it just rocking. That's the answer, isn't it? That's it, that's just rocking. There. That should be top to centre. Not quite, 20, 18 degrees. Well, it's pretty close, isn't it? Let me have a look. I... Yeah, that's more like seven degrees now. It, it... Do it again. So yeah, we, I'll tell you what we could do. So we're a little bit late, aren't we? Let's, um, let's bring that one right to the top. Let me just check on top of the centre, because moving that, it could be sliding, couldn't it? Yeah, it's about there. Right, that's it then. So we've finalised the valve timing uh, to what Mickey Hudson recommends for the cams. And um, we checked the valve clearances, and they're, they're not perfect, but they're pretty close, because obviously once you run the engine, it'll all change anyway. But while we were doing the cams, it occurred to us that one day we might have to get the, the main hub off, and that goes onto a taper. And when you tighten them up and put the split pins in them, you obviously tighten them up. So you'd have to be a bit clever to get them off. So anyway, so John made a, has made a puller, that you screw onto the to the um, the hub that's left in there because these are special, as I said, Paul Smith makes them. So there's like a hub, and then there's the next bit that you can actually move. So the hub you would have to use a puller to get it off. So anyway, we thought, well, it's bound to happen. So we've made a puller. So the next step really is to just put all the ancillaries back, which is very simple and. Not a lot of point in making a film about that. So um, really, when we've got it all together, we'll take it off the engine stand, we'll put it on the bench, and we'll take a lovely pictures of it. And, uh, and then that'll be the end of this video. I think on an earlier video, I mentioned that putting the flywheel on, we need a puller for the flywheel. Well, very often, when you take these flywheels to bits, they'd be bashed with hammers, they're bent, they're awful. So we decided that we'd put a thread on there because there's still a lot of metal and the main bit of metal was there anyway and make a tool up for pulling it off. So that goes on there. That screws on there. Because when I put flywheels on, we warm them up and we really put them on because on a taper on a flywheel, they have to be as tight as you can get them. So warm the flywheel, drop it on, tighten it up. And then obviously, is a drama to get it off. But what happens with this? This is a hydraulic puller, and this little thing puts eight tons on it, and usually they just pop off. But if you unless you can do it, and there's no other way of doing it. If you start mounting it outside there, you're bending the flywheel. So so that's essential, right? So every time we do a Samson engine, you know, we'll always put a thread on it, and we'll always have this lovely puller to take it off which will go in amongst all the other special tools. And I must say, we're going to have to write on them what they're for, because I keep looking at them, and I'm thinking, oh, I wonder what we made that for, I wonder what we... And obviously, as you're doing the job, you, you, you know, you, come, you remember 
But it would be nice to have a few uh, bits of information. That's a nice tool I found in a toolkit. It's a Michelin um, tire lever. And what happens is you can take it off and then you can hook that over, over a spoke. Works like a charm. I forget now, I think it came in the Don ZL toolbox. Claremont. Yeah, so that's that. So anyway, I think that's going to be more or less the end of the video of the engine, apart from some lovely pictures when we finally put all the little bits on. There's no point in making Tanner a load of hard work just doing that. So uh, there we are. Don't forget to subscribe, and I've entered the Derbyshire trial with Susie again, which is good. She's booked the hotel, and uh, we've got a clutch, and I'm going to try some even skinnier tyres, because I noticed the Austin Sevens, they tyres ridiculous with no pressure in them, and they were getting fabulous grip. So anyway, I'm going to try some thin tyres, but luckily, we're going off with the Range Rover people, hopefully, in the next few days. So we'll have a, be out, we'll have a bit of a test with the skinny tyres before we actually go on the trial. So that'll be good. So we'll, we'll keep you abreast of that. Right, there we are, that's the finished engine. Now, if that is not the best looking little twin cam engine in the world, I don't know what is. First one was made in 1922, then they productionised it. This engine comes from about 1926. And it's a Grand Prix special engine, which means it's got a free bearing crankshaft. And the only way you can tell it's got a free bearing crank is because you can see there's a, that little bolt there holds the centre main in position. So that's how you tell a free bearing engine. It has magneto this side, and it has a dynamo that side. And the tweaking San Sebastian engine would have had a mag both sides because it had twin plugs. And this is different and the block's different. But the bottom end is exactly the same on the supercharged one. This has got the wider sump, which I believe was on the supercharged one. But, you know, I mean, the fact that they put the cam buckets in upside down keeps that cam box very 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 narrow and obviously it was adapted from a four push rod engine and before that it was adapted from an air cooled engine but what a lovely thing eh? 1926 twin overhead cam smashy little engine take that off to get to the spark plugs plug leads come out here and go down to there it's only got one inlet box which is there, and the, obviously the gas goes down there and there, but they still go ever so well. And in the day, the petrol was so bad, petrol wasn't good like it is now. So having that inside there with a bit of heat was a good thing. So there we have it. Number 137. My dad's car was 136. Um, it says on there, four litres of oil because it's got the big sump and the smaller sump says three litres of oil um, and that's it really thanks to Paul Smith for supplying a lot of the bits Mickey Hudson for supplying the cams and all the gaskets um, the people near Goodwood who laser welded up the cam box because the bit that was missing here so, you know, hopefully it's going to go very nicely and we're going to try it in the car from Portugal. But I want to drive the car from Portugal with its engine it's got at the moment and then we'll fit it. Don't forget to subscribe. And that's it really. Back to the grindstone.